section one of practical forestry in the pacific northwest this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand practical forestry in the pacific northwest by edward tyson allen preface and introduction preface what this book is about and why the object of this booklet is to present the elementary principles of forest conservation as they apply on the pacific coast from montana to california there is a keen and growing interest in this subject citizens of the western states are beginning to realize that the forest is a community resource and that its wasteful destruction injures their welfare lumbermen are coming to regard timberland not as a mine to be worked out and abandoned but as a possible source of perpetual industry they find little available information however as to how these theories can be reduced to actual practice the western forestry and conservation association believes it can render no more practical service than by being the first to outline for public use definite workable methods of forest management applicable to western conditions a publication of this length can give little more than an outline but attempt has been made either to answer the most obvious questions which suggest themselves to timber owners interested in forest preservation or to guide the latter in finding their own answers only the most reliable conservative information has been drawn on much of it having been collected by the government while the booklet is intended to be of use chiefly to forest owners a chapter on the advantage to the community of a proper state forest policy is included also a chapter on tree growing by farmers the first presents the economic relation of forest preservation to public welfare with its problems of fire prevention taxation and reforestation for the use of writers legislators voters or others desiring to investigate this subject of growing public concern it is based upon the conclusions of the best unprejudiced authorities who have approached these problems from the public standpoint in the technical chapters on forest management and its possibilities the author accepts full responsibility for conclusions drawn except when otherwise noted to the forest service however is entitled the credit for collecting practically all the growth and yield figures upon which these conclusions are based a special acknowledgment is due to mr j f kummel for information on tree planting in concluding this preface the author regrets that the booklet which it introduces was necessarily written hurriedly a page or two at a time at odd hours taken from the work of a busy office for this reason its style and management leaves much to be desired but it has been thought better to make the information it contains immediately available than to await a doubtful opportunity to rewrite it introduction where we stand today what we have the five states of montana idaho washington oregon and california contain half the merchantable timber in the united states a fact of startling economic significance it means first of all that here is an existing resource of incalculable local and national value it means also that here lies the most promising field of production for all time the wonderful density and extent of our western forests are not accidental but result because climactic and other conditions are the most favorable in the world for forest growth in just the degree that they excel forests elsewhere is it easier to make them continue to do so what we are doing with it on the other hand forest fires in montana idaho washington oregon and california destroy annually on average timber which if used instead of destroyed would bring forty million dollars to their inhabitants idleness of burned and cut over land represents a direct loss almost as great these are actual money losses to the community so is the failure of revenue through the destruction of a tax resource equally important and hardly less direct is the injury to agriculture and industrial productiveness which depends upon a sustained supply of wood and water does it pay practically all this loss is unnecessary other countries have stopped the forest fire evil other countries have found a way to make forest land continue to grow forest consequently we can it is clearly only a question of whether it is worth while let us consider this question not only in its relation to posterity or to the lumbermen but from the standpoint of the average citizen of the west today end of section one
Section two of Practical Forestry in the Pacific Northwest by Edward Tyson Allen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Forestry and the Public. Timber means paychecks. Forest wealth is community wealth. The public's interest in it is affected very little by the passage of timber lands into private ownership, for all the owner can get out of them is the stumpage value. The people get everything else. Our forests earn nothing except by being cut and shipped to the markets of the world. Of the price received for them, usually much less than a fifth is received by the owner. Nearly all goes to pay for labor and supplies here at home. Even now, when the western lumber industry is insignificant compared to what it will be soon, it brings over $125 million a year into these five states. This immense revenue flows through every artery of labor, commerce, and agriculture, in the open farming countries as well as in the timbered districts. It is shared alike by laborer, farmer, merchant, artisan, and professional man. It is their greatest source of income, for lumber is the chief product which, being sold elsewhere, actually brings in outside money. That it is essential to the prosperity of every citizen to have this contribution to his livelihood continue requires no argument. From the manufacturing point of view of loan, our forest resources are as important to every one of us as to the lumberman, and in many ways more so, for if they are exhausted he can move or change his business, while the dependent industries cannot but our welfare is at stake in a dozen other ways also. Our interest as consumers. Every person who uses wood, whether to build, fence, burn, box his goods, or timber his mine, is directly interested in a cheap and plentiful supply of timber. Every acre burned, every cut over acre lying idle, raises the price for him without furnishing any revenue with which to help pay it. Every acre saved from fire, every acre of young growth, lowers it for him and puts money in circulation besides. Similarly, the cost to the consumer of most articles of everyday necessity is directly affected by the connection of forest material with air production. Wood and water are almost as essential to mining as ore, hence influence the price of metals. In the form of fuel, buildings, or boxes, if not as an actual constituent of the product itself, wood supply bears a like relation to almost every industry. Every reduction of the lumber traffic which helps support our railroads or of their supply of poles, ties, and car material tends to raise the cost of our groceries and other rail-transported commodities. School Lands Most of our western states have immense areas of forested grant lands, the sale of timber from which supports the public schools and other state institutions. Destruction of this asset is a direct blow to these institutions which can be only partially met by increased taxation. The farmer has the most at stake. In the case of western agriculture, the relation to the forest is fundamental and inseparable. Enough has been said to show that because of its importance as a sustaining industry, lumber manufacture is a prodigious factor in creating a market for farm products, also that the cost of all articles used by the farmer is cheapened by forest preservation. But back of this lies the all-important dependence of western agriculture upon irrigation. We must save the forests that store the waters. Of particular significance to the farmer, too, is the tremendous importance of forests as a source of tax revenue to help support state and county government. The cost of government is growing as our population grows. Taxable property grows mainly in the cities. Elsewhere we confront the problem of diminishing timber to tax, and consequent heavier and heavier burden on farm property. It will be a bad situation for the farmer if the timber is all destroyed and he has to pay all the taxes as well as a higher price for his buildings, fences, and fruit boxes. Every acre of timber burned or wasted hastens this day. The conservation thus suggested does not mean non-use of ripe timber, but it does mean protecting it from useless waste and destruction, and replacing it by reforestation when it is used. Conditions of life, the real issue involved. Lack of space forbids recounting many other ways in which the forest question touches the average citizen. It enters into our prospects of development, our investment values, and our insurance rates. Like the keystone of an arch or the link of a chain, forests cannot be destroyed without the collapse of the entire fabric. 
their preservation is not primarily a property question but a principle of public economy dealing with one of the elements of human existence and progress failure to treat it as such means harder conditions of life a handicap of industry not only for our children but for us as well it all sums up to this on every acre of western forest destroyed by fire or that fails to grow where it might grow we the citizens of the west who are not lumbermen bear fully eighty per cent of the direct loss and sustain serious further injury to our general safety and profit how we throw away millions notwithstanding the above facts we allow forty million dollars which we and our families should share to vanish every year leaving nothing more enduring than a pall of smoke from canada to the mexican line the great area thus denuded uselessly with that which produced public wealth through lumber manufacture together having been capable of affording a community resource of one hundred and sixty five million dollars are abandoned to lie idle and a menace to remaining timber it is exactly as though the owner of a 165 acre orchard should destroy 40 acres wantonly and also abandon the rest unfenced uncultivated and uncared for the one waste is as unnecessary as the other our pacific coast forests owe their unparalleled productiveness to a peculiarly fortunate combination of climate and rapid growing species unknown elsewhere nowhere else is forest reproduction so swift and certain nowhere can it be secured with so little effort and expense a little forethought and cutting methods and protection of the cut over area from recurring fires and an early second crop is assured saw timber can be grown in forty to seventy five years ties mine timber and piles in less how we might make immense profit instead it is reasonable to suppose that although the quality may be inferior to that of the old forest removed now timber scarcity will make a second cut in sixty years equally profitable per acre therefore if the area denuded annually at present were encouraged to reforest and protected it should at the end of that period again yield one hundred sixty five million dollars to the community each year's growth at present would be worth a sixtieth of that sum or two million seven hundred fifty thousand dollars if given any chance to do so the area deforested in only ten years would actually earn the people of our five western forest states twenty seven million five hundred thousand dollars a year almost nothing is being done to make it do so as a result of the same popular neglect this annual loss of nearly twenty eight millions of dollars is added to that of forty millions caused by destruction of merchantable timber by fire and the injury to tax revenue water supply and countless dependent industries still remain to be reckoned and to this sacrifice of wealth we add that of scores of human lives incredible suffering and the wiping out of homes and villages by forest fires plain words for our present policy let us draw a parallel if riot or invasion should sweep our pacific coast states killing unprotected settlers plundering banks and treasuries of forty million dollars of the people's savings and business capital and by destroying the producing power of commercial enterprise reduce the community's income by twenty eight millions more the catastrophe would startle the world if this stupendous disaster should threaten to recur the following year and every year thereafter indefinitely annually taking sixty seven million dollars from the earnings of the people diminishing their invested wealth and paralyzing their industries the situation would be unbearable it would dominate the minds of men women and children all else would be forgotten in their preparation for defense forest fire destruction is a danger in every way as real and immediate as riot or invasion equally measurable in losses to us today and far more reaching in effect upon future prosperity although less sensational it demands no less prompt action the action we must take the foregoing facts prove that our present forest policy is unprofitable to the state and its citizens what then is the remedy at first though it may seem that the responsibility for this lies with the man who controls the land the timber owner and lumberman he does have his part to play which is discussed elsewhere in this booklet but he will not indeed cannot do so unless the rest of us play ours the community must not only cooperate but in some directions must act first because from the beginning the lumberman is governed by so many conditions which are fixed by the people 
it is for the people to make these conditions reasonably favorable so that he will have neither excuse nor incentive for failing to conform to them in this cooperation the people should not be expected to grant privileges which are not for their own advantage also nor should they hesitate to cooperate if it is to their advantage merely because it is also a help to the lumberman it is natural that the public should disincline to assume any further burden to enrich the timber owner were this the sole object of forest protection it would be fair to leave it to him but it is the height of bad economy to obstruct or refuse to help him in handling forest resources to our best advantage whether he gains or loses is merely incidental to us but whether we gain or lose is of very great importance first step is to stop forest fires obviously reduction of the forest fire hazard is the most urgent problem not only is fire the greatest destroyer of existing forests but it also discourages investment in reforestation the public has a right to expect the lumberman to adopt every safeguard against it in his operations nevertheless the first step to encourage him in this is to reduce the appalling carelessness with fire in which the people of the west are the worst offenders in the world today forest fires are almost always unnecessary they usually result from a neglect of consideration for injury and distress to others which is not shown by the american people in any other connection the traveler or resident in forest regions simply fails to realize that his own welfare and that of countless others requires the same precaution not to let fire escape and the same activity in extinguishing fires he discovers that are accorded as a matter of course in cities and towns in reality they are more important a san francisco can burn down and it is soon replaced insurance and capital come to the rescue labor is employed and business is resumed but when the forest burns industry dies and labor is driven away empty-handed it is a big price to pay for neglecting the slight effort required to prevent it fairly good fire laws are on our statute books presumably they were intended to prevent fires yet almost every forest community sees fire after fire set through ignorance carelessness or purpose and so far from punishing the offenders accords them every privilege of business and society in cities however insignificant the damage arson leads to the penitentiary a forest fire may destroy millions and the cause not even be investigated if aggravated by a particularly inexcusable case of malice or carelessness some property holder seldom the people secures an arrest acquittal is practically certain because the community considers the matter none of its business then the value of the fire law is at an end in that region certainly we cannot expect the timber owner to protect our forest interests until we ourselves respect and at least attempt to enforce our forest laws patrol service absolutely essential but necessary as is better public sentiment we must also have practical machinery for enforcing the laws and for stopping the fires that do start just as a city is safeguarded best by an organized fire department so the forest can be protected effectively only by trained men who know the work and the man who prevents the most fires is the man who is looking for them not the man who goes after the fire is under way theodore roosevelt says i hold us first among the tasks before the state and the nation in their respective shares in forest conservation the organization of efficient fire patrols and the enactment of good fire laws on the part of the states the national conservation commission reports each state within whose boundaries forest fires are working grave injury and that means every forest state must face the fact squarely that to keep down forest fires needs not merely a law upon the statute books but an effective force of men actually on the ground to patrol against fire we all know that few disastrous fires start under conditions which prevent their control usually they spring from some of the many small apparently innocent fires which burn unnoticed until wind and hot weather fan them into action it is far cheaper to put them out in the incipient stage than to fight them later perhaps unsuccessfully until after great damage has been done and if fighting is necessary it is of the highest importance to have it led by competent experienced men moments count and bad judgment is expensive most western states already have laws regulating the use of fire for clearing during the dry season to accomplish this with safety and without hardship requires fire wardens to issue permits and help with the burning if necessary public knowledge that there is someone to enforce the law tends to restrain the dangerous class 
still more useful is the service of fire wardens in agitating the fire question and keeping before forest residents the advantage of their cooperation cooperation with private owners desirable in fire patrol especially the state and the lumberman must work together it is reasonable that the timber owner should contribute to the protection of his property he also has peculiar facilities for getting the work done well and cheaply as a rule he is willing to do his part in 1910 the Washington Forest Fire Association and other timber owners in that state paid out three hundred thousand dollars for patrol and other fire work the Coeur d'Alene Clearwater Potlatch and Pen d'Oral Timber Protective Associations spent over two hundred thousand dollars in Idaho Oregon timbermen spent approximately one hundred thirty thousand dollars figures are not available for Montana and California but probably the same proportion holds thorough support by the state is necessary to make private work effective the men employed must have official authority to enforce the law the dangerous element does not respect a movement which nominally represents only the property owner the people in general do not aid it as much as they do one in which they also share therefore it is necessary to have state facilities for cooperating in the organization authorization and supervision of all forest patrols liberal appropriation a good investment but to stop here is like attempting to protect a city from fire merely by giving its factory owners the right to maintain watchmen we want to provide for the greatest possible advantage to the people through the timber owner's desire to protect his own property but any forest policy which ends with this is hopelessly weak we cannot afford to leave any matter of public welfare wholly to the wisdom and philanthropy of private enterprise if we expect our paramount interest in forest and water resources to be looked out for properly we must pay for it just as we do for all other protection we get through organized government nor should we forget that the timber owner helps us again in this for he pays taxes as well as the cost of his private patrol there are also many regions where timber values do not warrant patrol but where the safety of other property and of life demand both patrol and fire fighting here the state owes its citizens protection moreover one of the weakest points in our present system everywhere is lack of police authority to apprehend violators of the fire laws the private warden cannot successfully arrest or prosecute offenders and everybody knows it most fires start through violation of law to prevent them the law must be respected and to accomplish this there must be state officers who can and will apprehend offenders without fear or favor any western state can well afford to spend one hundred thousand dollars a year for a forest fire service which will prevent a loss of fifty times that sum the cost is imperceptible by the citizen his benefit immediate forest protection is the cheapest form of prosperity insurance a timbered state can buy reforestation although it does not pay to burn up our forests it does pay to use them the faster we can replace them with new ones the quicker this profit can be made with safety forest land is community capital to let it lie idle is as wasteful as destruction and we must also remember that the day is coming when our forested streams must do a hundred times their present duty and when the lumber consumers question may not be what must i pay for a board but can i get a board at all we must have new forests coming as the old ones go the federal government is practicing forestry in the lands controlled by the forest service why should the states not do the same thing with their school and tax deed lands intelligent care of timbered school land selling the timber only under regulations which will ensure reforestation would realize as much today and in the long run pay a thousand percent in dividends for the education of our children and our children's children further than this there should be legislation to permit the state to solidify its forest lands by exchange when advisable and to authorize the purchase of cut over lands the eventual profit in this is certain to be great and nothing will do more to interest the public and private owners in reforestation it is the history of all countries that forests are peculiarly profitable state property especially when as is the case with us it can be acquired cheaply it is a sound and well-proved policy that it is well for the state to own lands which are not adapted for permanent individual development forest lands constitute the ideal class not only because the state is in the best position to keep up their usefulness to the community but also because they will earn perpetual revenue far greater than they could bring through taxation they will pay back the cost and interest become increasingly valuable and still pay dividends 
it is even more important that reforestation be secured on private lands because their area is greater than that owned by the states and governments with the encouragement which could be given the owner without any undeserved concession conditions would warrant him in securing it we have reached that stage in our development the exhaustion of timber in the country at large the increase of consumption and our peculiar natural advantages have combined to promise adequate financial return and the lumberman does not want to go out of business unless he has to obstacles to private effort to ensure a second crop the lumberman has to lose more or less money when he cuts the first his methods must be more expensive and he must forego present profits on trees he leaves if he plants the outlay is considerable but let us suppose he is willing to do all this not because he is a philanthropist but because he wants more trees to run his mill some day it is a comparatively simple matter to get his second crop started american forestry has solved this problem fairly well it is also easy to calculate in most cases beginning with the sale value of cut over land using safe estimate of the next yield and the time required to mature it and setting a conservative future stumpage value that growing timber ought to be a profitable investment if that were all we could leave the lumberman alone and count on him to perpetuate our forests because it will pay him to do so but the whole calculation consequently the public's interest as well as his is upset by two factors the danger that his investment will burn up and the practical certainty that taxes will eat up all profit before the harvest if he figures on fire protection at his own expense against the hazard as it now exists and the tax burden on cut over land which is indicated at present his engagement in forest growing will be negligible from the point of view of public welfare in some cases he may hold the land a while in few can he afford to protect it in still fewer is he justified in actually doing anything to ensure reforestation if a man proposes to build a factory or railroad in a community the inhabitants usually encourage him they do not refuse him fire protection in the first place and then if his plant burns down threaten to burn it again and keep up full taxation on the vacant land they offer every fair inducement to get the industry and keep it flourishing they expect it to pay its just share of taxation, but want it to continue to do so as long as possible. Tax New Crop When Harvested It has been shown that the first obstacle to reforestation of private land can be removed only by supporting a fire patrol and creating public sentiment which will reduce the number of fires. The second is even more wholly in the hands of the people, for by the system of taxation they impose, they decide whether it shall continue an earning power and a tax source forever, or be abandoned to become a desert, non-producing, non-taxable, and a menace to stream flow. Whether its owner has made money on the original crop has no bearing on the result, nor has his being rich or poor, resident or alien. Cut over land presents a distinct problem to him he will and should pay a full tax on its earning power which will be demonstrated when he successfully brings another crop to maturity but he cannot carry an investment for fifty years or more without return with a risk of total loss by fire up to the last moment at a cost which would bring him better profit in some other business these facts are recognized by all students of forestry the following authorities hold no brief for the lumbermen they approached the subject solely from the side of the people theodore roosevelt second only to good fire laws is the enactment of tax laws which will permit the perpetuation of existing forests by use national conservation commission present tax laws prevent reforestation of cut over land and the perpetuation of existing forests by use an annual tax upon the land itself exclusive of the timber and a tax upon the timber when cut is well adapted to actual conditions of forest investment and is practicable and certain it would ensure a permanent revenue from the forest in the aggregate far greater than is now collected and yet be less burdensome upon the state and upon the owner it is better from every side that forest land should yield a moderate tax permanently than it should yield an excessive revenue temporarily and then cease to yield at all h s graves chief forester for the u s private owners do not practice forestry for one or more of three reasons one the risk of fire two burdensome taxation three low prices of products professor fairchild tax expert yale university forestry must come some time and its early coming is a thing greatly to be desired we can hardly hope to see the general practice of forestry as long as the present methods of taxation continue with regard to its effect on revenue there is little to be feared from the tax on yield 
it is equitable and certain if a tax at once equitable and dependable is guaranteed the business of forestry will not need to ask special favors crying need for definite state policy to accomplish these reforms will take law making and law enforcing however well we study existing conditions and legislate upon the premises they furnish success depends upon competent application of the laws and their improvement as conditions change it is a bitter reproof to us of the west that eastern states with forest and water resources insignificant compared to ours have gone so much farther in securing the services of trained men to study these questions and to guard both private and public interests the very first step should be to get competent trained state foresters who will devise wise measures protect us from unwise ones and educate lumbermen and public alike to the common need of action we pay cheerfully for every other kind of public service for geologists veterinarians insurance commissioners barber examiners and what not but the two things we must have wood and water we leave pretty much to take care of themselves and they aren't doing it and never will the essentials of a wise state forest policy based not on theory but on successful experience elsewhere are as cheap as they are simple where tried they have never been abandoned if they pay elsewhere can we afford not to try following is the framework of a code demanded by the situation in every western state some already approach it but none goes far enough essentials of effective state forest code one a state board of forestry selected with the single view of ensuring the most competent expert judgment on the matters with which it deals in other words the board should not be political but appointment by the governor should be restricted to the responsible representatives nominated by the interests most familiar with forest management such as state forest schools lumbermen's associations forest fire associations conservation associations and the resident federal forest service two a trained state forester wholly independent of politics executive ability and practical forest knowledge should be considered essential also scientific training he should have one or more assistants of his own appointing three a liberally supported forest fire service in which the state forester has ample latitude and cooperation financial and otherwise with all other agencies in the same work four a systematic study of forest conditions to afford basis of both intelligent administration and desirable further legislation five a system for active general popular education with specific advice to individuals in proper forest management six application of forestry principles to the management of state-owned forest lands and the purchase of cut or burned over land better suited for state than for private forestry this is to furnish educative examples of conservative management as well as to maintain state revenue and proper forest conditions seven improvement and strict enforcement of laws against fire and trespass with penalty for neglect to enforce them by any officer who is paid to do so eight encouragement of reforestation by assessing deforested land annually on land value only deferring taxation of forest growth until its cutting furnishes income with which to meet the tax nine thorough study of the subject of taxing standing timber to the end of securing a system which by ensuring a fair revenue without enforcing bad forest management will result in the greatest community good do it now you the average citizen of the west are responsible for the present situation and for its remedy merely to agree that it is unfortunate and virtuously to condemn firebugs careless lumbermen and indifferent legislators does not relieve you of the responsibility neither will it protect you from the consequences on the other hand the firebug will not fire if he knows it will not be tolerated the lumberman will adopt protective methods if you encourage him the legislator is glad to help in any way his constituents suggest they are all only waiting for a word from you whose welfare is really at stake and from whom the word should come if any other principle of public safety say suppression of fraud burglary or murder were being so generally ignored what would you do would you not look up the laws of the state and find a way of letting everyone connected with their enforcement know that you expected them to be enforced if you found laws or appropriations inadequate would you not see to it that every representative in the legislature knew his constituents demanded improvement 
the legislator or public official is anxious to comply with the people's wishes but he must know what the people want it is essential to let him know that you want a progressive and liberally supported state policy that will save our immense forest wealth from needless destruction end of section two Section 3 of Practical Forestry in the Pacific Northwest by Edward Tyson Allen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Forestry and the Lumberman. The Underlying Principles. The lumber industry is undergoing a process of reorganization which reaches to its very foundations. It is so deep seated as to be almost imperceptible from outward evidence but is of profound significance to the owner of timberland and to the public hitherto lumbering in the united states has consisted chiefly of manufacturing and selling the raw material has occupied no consistent place in the equation the value it has had in fixing the price of the finished product has been merely in its relation to transportation intrinsically it has been accorded no value this situation continued just as long as there was practically free government timber to be had by opening it up it continues now only relatively however transportation must always remain a great factor the timber owner is still obliged temporarily to meet his obligations by means determined under the old basis nevertheless the moment it became impossible to get timber to manufacture without assuming the cost of producing such as fire protection taxation and interest began an era of inevitable natural regulation from that time on timber began to assume a value which although affected by transportation facilities must eventually be fixed chiefly by the cost of growing other timber to compete with it timber is worth the cost of growing it in other words the value of anything is what it costs to produce it whether it is a tree or a box of apples that we found our timber orchard growing when we came to this country does not change this law it was suspended temporarily while any individual could profit by the growth produced without cost but began to operate again when he could no longer do so we are now in a transition period of adjustment the important thing to remember is that this will not continue until the entire output has actually borne the full cost of production for before then investments in standing timber will have been regulated by the same influence it is true that at present the cost of lumber to the consumer is not fixed absolutely even by the cost of manufacturing and selling it and that on the contrary it fluctuates greatly with the willingness of the consumer to buy but this except within limits is not a sound working out of the law of supply and demand it is an incident to the unsound basis of production which still prevails so long as a very large portion of our standing timber has not cost the owner much in either price protection taxes and interest some of it will be put on the market at a low price in order to carry a milling business through a depressed period to realize money or for other exigency reasons so may a wheat grower lose money on one or two years crops but if in the long run the world refuses to pay for wheat what it costs to grow it wheat will not be grown the real question is whether or not the world needs forests enough to pay for them demand will continue it is evident from the history of older countries that it does while consumption per capita will undoubtedly decrease population is growing substitution will be necessary but will not supplant wood for a multitude of purposes much has been said about the use of steel concrete and like materials in building the building trades only use sixty per cent of our lumber today without considering fuel it is unlikely that the reduction of this percentage will very much more than offset the growth in volume of the reduced percentage due to increased population fifty years ago there was scarcely a lumber user west of the mississippi river we know the settlements mines railroads and cities that have developed since to use lumber it is a poor westerner who doubts that the next fifty years will see a far greater development and the panama canal is coming with a certain result of making our fast producing forests able to compete successfully with eastern and european forest crops grown with less natural advantage moreover we would now use three and a half times as much wood a year as our forests produce consequently the demand might even fall off three and a half times and still consume the product and the forest producing area diminishes constantly 
little as we now consider the possibilities of food famine history shows that nations rapidly increase to the limit of their agricultural production or beyond and we must reckon not only on our own increase but also upon immigration from and export to nations whose pressure upon their production exceeds ours it is certain that land now considered too remote rough and poor for agriculture will be put to that use we know that other countries do not to any considerable extent devote land to forest that will grow food crops at all well adjustment only question of time consequently it is safe to assume that within reasonable limits the consumer will be glad to pay the cost of growing timber when he is obliged to do so it is also to be expected that the community will desire to maintain a resource which employs labor pays taxes and conserves stream flow therefore the price of lumber will be governed as the price of every staple commodity is governed by a cost of production including reasonable profit by those engaged in the several stages of the process that it will include the growing of new timber on a sound profitable basis is proved by the history of other countries which have undergone the same regulation this after all is the strongest argument with which to answer the skeptic who on premises and judgment of his own doubts the above conclusions we need not claim greater prophetic ability but have only to make the undeniable assertion that hindsight is better than foresight nothing demonstrates economic laws so irrefutably as experience less than twenty nine per cent of the land area of the united states is occupied by forests today including swamps burns and much land which will be devoted to agriculture germany where great economy of material is practice where wooden buildings are far fewer where indeed the per capita consumption is only a seventh of ours keeps twenty six per cent of her land area under the most expensive forest management and finds the profit constantly increasing she is increasing her production and importing heavily from countries where lumber is cheap like the united states yet the net returns per acre from the forest of baden rose from two dollars thirty eight cents in eighteen eighty to five dollars eight cents in nineteen o two this was due hugely of course to improvement of management in france lands which only fifty years ago could not be sold for four dollars an acre now bring an annual revenue of three dollars in nineteen o three the town forest of winterthur switzerland brought net receipts of eleven dollars sixty nine cents an acre these are fair examples in countries where the influence tending toward less use of wood have been working for a very long time they show such influences do not result in refusal to pay the cost of growing all the wood that can be grown wood consumption in european countries is increasing at a rate of from one and one half to two per cent a year in other words the consumers are actually willing to pay for more wood than they have found necessary and are warranting the growers in adopting still more expensive methods to increase the output nor has forest growing proved to be possible only by the state or government in germany forty six point five per cent of the forest area is owned privately in austria sixty one per cent in france sixty five per cent in norway seventy per cent while it is true that the european private owner has better tax and fire conditions it must also be remembered that the value of the land on which he makes the growing crop yield a good dividend is about ten times as high as it is now in the united states the prospective grower of new timber in the american west can expect equal profit here at some time his chief concern is whether its foreshadowing influences are sufficiently strong at present to determine this he must consider the probable attitude of the public and of the lumbermen themselves what it means to the consumer to the consumer the principles previously outlined mean that the price of lumber will rise somewhat indeed he must expect that regardless of the production factor for the timber owner cannot pay taxes prevent fire and keep his money tied up all for a considerable period and still sell the material as cheap as he could before these expenses accrued it also means that if the consumer fails to recognize and concede these principles it will be at his own sacrifice too low prices now merely mean too high prices in the early future for they will not permit production economy or reforestation he must eventually and not far hence pay the total cost of production it is urgently to his interest not to add to this by preventing production and thus permitting the owner of the timber already produced to speculate on the approaching shortage the danger of this can be illustrated by a comparison suppose three-quarters of the apple growers of the country either through ignorance of the principles of their industry or 
through shortage of money with which to pay their debts should be forced for a considerable period to accept a price for their crops so low that after paying current bills they were obliged to neglect their orchards absolutely without ploughing fencing or spraying suppose further that the public should also destroy a large portion of the orchards as the forests are by fire and also overtax the land so as to complete the discouragement clearly apples would immediately go up a few growers would doubtless escape absolute destruction and these as long as their orchards lasted would demand a price overbalancing many times the saving the consumer made temporarily while he was destroying the industry everyone concerned would be worse off than if prices had remained just high enough to maintain an adequate supply it is improbable however that the consumer will ever voluntarily pay more than he has to even if it is to his ultimate advantage the most that can be hoped is that as the public at large comes to understand the situation it will not support him in the claim that injustice is being done by the rises he is forced to meet as conditions adjust themselves his reluctance will retard but not stop the progress of good forest management states will take a hand on the other hand it is reasonable to suppose that the people of the timber producing states will gradually come to see that their interest as well as that of the lumbermen is to be furthered by placing the industry on a sound basis selling more lumber than they consume they will not rejoice over low prices any more than a wheat state does over the fall of wheat because it uses some flour but they will be unequally able to exert much stiffening influence on the price consequently they will probably attempt to sustain the industry by increasing production but in this attempt they will consider immediate community advantage first future community advantage next and the lumberman's advantage only as it is incidental and such measures as they endorse they are likely to enforce by law we see then that two forces are making for the better handling of our forest resources the economic necessity of the public and the business advantage of the owner both demand the maximum production obviously since their aims are identical each has to gain from earnest cooperation neither can succeed alone for the owner cannot go far against hostile laws or sentiment and the public cannot accomplish half as much by compulsion as by encouraging the owner but the great danger to each lies in mutual distrust which defers the establishment of effective cooperation lumbermen must show good faith the primary and all-important moral which all this points out to the lumberman is that his position under coming conditions will be largely what he makes it by his own attitude with the rapidity with which he gets into a position where his voice is listened to as unselfish and authoritative on the conservation subject will his influence on the new conditions be measured therefore he must study the subject he must be able to support good laws and oppose bad laws with facts and arguments which will stand scrutiny above all he must show faith by practicing what he preaches so far as he is able he must show conclusively the injustice of the public suspicion from which he suffers conservative forest management has three essentials protection utilization and reproduction the last particularly depends on the first the timber owner cannot protect adequately alone before he can expect much public help however he must show his willingness to do his share for the state will not assume the whole burden the progressive members of the industry have shown it already and the result is evident in the commencement of the states to help their help will increase in the proportion that private effort spreads presumably it will be the same with reforestation with the fire hazard lessened there will remain the obstacle of overtaxation on property returning no income with which to meet it the public will doubtless soon see that this is bad for the community but will hesitate to forego present revenue in order to reap greater future revenue until convinced that the owner will actually reforest if given the chance even if no actual desire to take advantage is ascribed there may be fear that he will make no active effort to start and protect the second crop but will merely continue the course of least expense in the hope that a new forest will establish itself with little to lose if it fails before he will receive the encouragement he deserves he must prove his good faith the surest way to do this is to begin actual work now where he can without certainty of failure unfortunately this is often impossible but he can at least study and experiment so he can argue convincingly that mutual success will follow reasonable encouragement circumstances determine profit let us assume then that it is best for the lumberman to start the practice of forestry for the purpose of strengthening his position and getting the most favorable conditions possible for its general adoption and continuance 
how much does he depend upon success in this obviously early public favor will hasten and add to the security of forest growing as a business but is it absolutely essential do existing conditions and inevitable future conditions regardless of public intelligence furnish premises upon which we can calculate certain profit in some degree this depends upon the circumstances of the individual investor without an expectation of more favorable fire and tax influences reforestation cannot be universally recommended as a business proposition many timber owners are not warranted in undertaking it not enough are warranted in doing so to ensure the future timber supply upon which public welfare depends nevertheless there are conditions under which it is a good investment it is even probable that for those who are well situated the very obstacles which deter others will be advantageous through reducing competition the fact is of peculiar significance to the public for if the latter fails to stimulate reforestation generally it will play directly into the hands of the few who are independent of encouragement it is customary in speculating upon the profits of a second timber crop to attempt to reduce it to a financial calculation based upon estimated yield estimated future values and estimated carrying charges these considerations are important but their importance is largely in proportion to the financial weakness of the prospective timber grower we revert again to the practical certainty that unless reforestation is general the exhaustion of virgin timber will be followed by a shortage and that the man who has a second crop at that time can obtain a price which will reimburse his carrying charges be they high or low the cost of overcoming present obstacles will be shifted to the consumer the possibility of such an investment is determined largely by ability to maintain a protective system with economy and to bear the expense of this and heavy taxation during the period of no return in short the weakness of the ordinary financial calculation upon existing conditions is that it attempts to estimate future stumpage values without knowledge of the true factor which will determine them this factor is not the probable rise of existing stumpage while it continues to exist but is the extent of the new grown supply which will follow it provided existing conditions remain unchanged it is inconsistent to figure the cost upon almost prohibitive present conditions without also recognizing that such conditions if continued will completely change the influences which now determine the market who can afford to reforest now on the other hand timber owners have by no means equal opportunity to take advantage of this fact the productive capacity of their land varies their taxes vary the extent and location of their holdings affects the expense of protection against fire and they have not the same facilities for financing a long-term investment it is the balance of these factors that determine their opportunity assuming rate of timber growth to be equal present fire and tax conditions classify them in relative advantage about as follows one owners of large holdings of virgin timber who can meet carrying charges by occasional sales at a profit over their purchase price but will not sell much more than is necessary because all they can afford to hold is advancing in value such owners have more or less land deforested by fire or their own milling operations and will incline to sell only stumpage without land this land is not easily realized upon at present and for the speculative reason stated they will continue in business long enough to grow a new crop on it the larger their holdings the greater the certainty of this and the cheaper relatively the cost of protection moreover concerns dealing with large and long-term investments can consider a lower interest rate two owners with less facility for making an actual profit through growing timber but desiring to maintain a milling business even if the cost of growing approaches or equals the value of the crop they will be able to count on continued manufacturing profit both of the above classes face a possibility of so heavy a tax on their virgin timber in some instances that they will be obliged to cut it and go out of business this is unlikely to occur generally however for tax reform is almost inevitable and it would have a compensatory effect of enhancing the value of the second crop three owners whose holdings are not large enough to keep them in business until a second crop matures but are advantageously located second growth need not be mature to have a value as the present supply diminishes available coming supply will gain a high expectation value which can be realized upon the profit it offers will be largely determined by its proximity to market and especially by its proximity to established mills which see their own supply running short and have failed through inability or lack of foresight to engage in reforestation themselves it will also be affected by tax and fire charges and the latter especially will be largely a matter of location 
4. The owner with no peculiar advantages, who can only set the general certainty of a market for second growth against his ability to carry a costly and uncertain investment for an indeterminate time. Of course, a first consideration in most cases is the comparative profits of other possible investments or, in other words, the exact interest demanded as satisfactory. Individuals are in by no means the same position in this respect either by inclination, opportunity, or talent. Where one might be safer with his money in timber, another could make more by manufacturing. Generally speaking, however, conservative judgment leads to the conclusion that the present attitude of the public warrants the first of the above four classes of owners in undertaking inexpensive reforestation where the land has little sale value for other purposes, and where the growth and fire factors are reasonably favorable. The second class can also undertake it to advantage on much the same basis, but having less capacity for meeting the carrying charge, requires still more favorable conditions. The third class must have the maximum advantage of every kind. It must calculate closely on the factors of cost and profit indicated by present conditions. In most cases the risk will be too great for prudence, and in nearly all financial ability will be lacking. The fourth class cannot even consider it until the public's attitude changes. Better day for all is near. On the other hand, it is reasonable to suppose that publicly imposed obstacles will decrease. It will become apparent that their persistence is bad economy fires will grow fewer and the state will aid in patrol reforestation in itself is a method of fire prevention when it places a green young growth on a fire inviting tract of sun-dried litter and weeds taxation will be deferred as the country develops interest rates will fall making it easier to carry forced investments and harder to gain more through other investments the state itself will engage more and more in forestry with the result of making its principles understood and endorsed stumpage values will increase immature timber will have a sale value lessening the term of investment gradually the business will get on a sound production basis better for the consumer better for the state supported by a forest income and more profitable for the grower instead of capitalizing bad management and the sacrifice of the consumer which in effect it does now by forcing the prospective grower to calculate on covering unnecessary cost in the price received it will capitalize the earning power of forest land while final adjustment on this basis is still in the future it is by no means entirely dependent upon popular foresight the process is going on constantly whether we know it or not the sun is still behind the horizon but the day is sure many western timber owners are still in too dim a light to make their footsteps certain others have a high vantage ground where dawn already lights the path end of section three Section 4 of Practical Forestry in the Pacific Northwest by Edward Tyson Allen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Forestry and the Forest, Part 1. Elementary Principles of Forest Growth. Whether the lumberman's judgment of economic influences leads him to be optimistic or otherwise as to the profit of forestry in general, he is most interested in the particular forest with which he has to deal. He can neither accept nor dismiss the proposition intelligently, much less put his ideas into actual practice, without knowing something of the capability of his land to respond to his effort. What methods are best, what will they cost, and what will be the result, are questions which arise at the very outset. They lead at once into the domain of technical forestry. With us, forestry has not been practiced long enough to furnish demonstrated examples with which to answer such questions. We can, however, profit by experience gained elsewhere, for the laws which govern tree life are as universal as those which govern the life of men and animals. In dealing with new species and new environments, we have no great difficulty in judging their future from their past, which lies written plainly for those who care to study it. While to some extent trees require elements obtainable only from the soil, they are much more independent in this respect than most other forms of vegetation. Soil influences forest trees mainly by its physical character, especially as this determines the moisture contents. Very little nourishment is actually taken out of the soil, for as someone has said, wood is nothing but air solidified by sunshine. A tree's immense and complicated foliage system is the laboratory with which it affects this transformation. Since air exists everywhere and the chemical quality of the soil is comparatively unimportant, the requirements of different species for light, heat, and moisture are what mainly determine their distribution and habits of growth. 
and since heat and moisture are largely climactic factors and fairly uniform in given localities it follows that the demand of a species upon light may practically fix its habits and possibilities in those localities the very great variance of species in light requirement accounts to a large extent for the composition of the most primeval forests it is of peculiar importance in the management of forests by man because he cannot control it as he may be able to control some of the other agencies which affected the primeval forest such as fire or seed supply selection forests it would be unprofitable to discuss here all the many methods of forest management which have proved to be the best technically for given species and combinations of species where market and transportation facilities are highly favorable as in europe the timber owner can adopt the method which will bring the best results but here he has no such choice he can but bear in mind certain fundamental principles uniformly applicable to large areas for considerable periods of time roughly however our western forests can be classified by their adaptability to the two directly opposite systems known as clean cutting and selection cutting of which almost all methods are modifications a selection forest is one in which all ages of trees exist from seedling to maturity it is the natural growth of species which are tolerant of shade in a natural state undisturbed by cutting it maintains much the same aspect continuously for as the oldest trees die their place is taken by younger ones obviously such a forest must be composed of species whether one or several which can grow beneath its own shade the understories of varying ages are as dense as their light requirements and the density of the overwood permit the common hardwood forests of the east illustrate one type of the natural selection forest on the pacific slope an example is afforded by hemlock either practically pure or mixed with white fir but probably the most typical is the ordinary western yellow pine under certain conditions at its best this tree composes a forest so dense that all young growth is shaded out but everyone is familiar with the frequent opener stand containing all ages the younger trees are often called blackjack even aged forests on the other hand trees extremely intolerant of shade occur only in what the forester calls even aged forests being unable to start in the darkness of an existing stand of any considerable density they must seize opportunities to recover openings the douglas fir of the northwest more commonly called red or yellow fir is an excellent illustration in the interior states this species reproduces under cover to some extent because there is a stronger light average throughout the year and because the stand is not so dense in the typical douglas fir forests of oregon and washington discussed in this booklet it never does so while hemlock cedar and white fir undergrowth may be abundant douglas fir seedlings are seldom seen except in burns slashings roads or open spots in the woods and the fir trees composing the dominant stand are of nearly the same age how then did this even aged fir forest begin close scrutiny will practically always find the answer in fragments of charred wood long ago another similar forest occupied the ground until lightning or an indian's fire started a new cycle possibly recurring burns swept the area many times before wind-blown seeds began to start advanced groups of fir which when fifteen or twenty years old themselves fruited and filled the blanks between them perhaps destruction was not so complete and surviving trees made the process a swifter one except in the very oldest forests where remains of the original stand have entirely rotted away the history in either case may be read in ancient snags and fallen logs suppose however that fire had not come to aid in the fir perpetuating itself this too we can answer from the signs today every northwestern woodsman knows tracks of varying size usually small because fire has been almost universal covered with big old hemlock white fir and cedar with here and there a dying giant fir perhaps but mainly showing fir occupancy only by rotting stumps and logs no sign of fire is seen when this fir forest was approaching middle age the shade bearing species began to appear beneath it as the firs began to crowd themselves out the later comers shot up with increased light and filled the open places at last the even aged fir forest was completely transformed into a selection forest of other trees which will remain until some accident again gives fir a chance if any survives near enough to reach the spot with seed douglas fir is not the only western tree which usually grows in even aged stands lodgepole pine has the same habit often supplanting yellow pine after fire or logging 
western white pine is perhaps more tolerant than douglas fir hence more likely to hold its own without artificial aid but is also more certain to compete successfully if it has such aid the same is true of tamarack nature as a model we thus see that if economic reasons suggest it we may use the selection system as a basis for artificially managing the shade bearing species such as hemlock white fir cedar spruce and even western yellow pine we may cut the largest and oldest trees and still have a well-started second crop if there is not much young growth to leave even a little is valuable it may be decidedly best to leave medium-sized trees which otherwise we would cut because they are still growing rapidly on the other hand we see that this method would not be of any advantage at all in ensuring a second crop of douglas fir for there is no young growth of this species to protect the small and medium-sized trees instead of being immature are merely stunted specimens of the same age as their larger brothers and unlikely to gain in size if left selection cutting here would save for future use only such understory of shade bearing species as may exist unless this is an object the best plan is to cut clean and get all we can if we leave any fur at all it is for the purpose of reseeding not to secure better utilization of the trees themselves and whether we do so depends theoretically at least upon whether it is better than artificial seeding or planting in short selection cutting harvests the ripest trees of a perpetual forest while clean cutting destroys the forest in order to start an entirely new and more rapid growing one clean cutting is therefore necessary as well as natural in dealing with intolerant trees but it does not follow that the selection system although natural to tolerant species is the only one adaptable to them while the one class demands light the other does not demand shade it is merely capable of enduring it indeed except for the greater susceptibility of some species to extreme heat and dryness when very young as a rule shade-bearing trees grow much better if they do have ample light supply consequently clean cutting may be the best system for these also under certain economic conditions besides its influence upon the occurrence of species in the forest light practically governs the physical form of the individual tree if grown in an opening and not artificially pruned a tree will have a conical trunk and living branches almost down to the ground the denser and consequently darker the forest the more cylindrical the trunk the smaller the crown of branches and the greater the clear length an individual tree has no object in assuming a desirable commercial form and does so only when deprived of side light by numerous neighbors then it sacrifices diameter growth to height growth in reaching for the top light necessary for its life at the same time the lower branches are killed by shade and drop off the scars being healed and eventually buried the pin knots near the center of a big clear log are the remains of branches which when living were at the top of the young tree this is why if it is to produce good timber any forest must be dense enough to cover the ground throughout the early part of its life at least when we see an excellent clear stand of mature douglas fir for example we may know that it consists of the comparatively few survivors of a close sapling growth in which the weak were gradually killed out after serving their office of pruning and forcing the vigorous had only the trees we now see been on the ground they would be worthless except for firewood for the same reason artificial forest planting must be thick although the fillers or nurse trees may be of inferior species if not of so rapid growth as to gain the mastery nature teaches many lessons which we must recognize in artificial management or fail but she is no more the best grower of forest crops than she is of agricultural crops we have to study natural methods of forest perpetuation to see how they may be improved upon as much as to adopt them as models as a rule the virgin forest is exceedingly wasteful of ground the possibilities under intelligent care are not indicated by nature's average but by her accidental best and usually they far exceed even this a fair comparison is that of scientific farming with unsystematic gleaning from wild and untended fields the foregoing general principles of forest growth have been purposely outlined very briefly so as to serve as a mere introduction to their application or modification in concrete cases management of specific types Douglas fir, Pseudotsuga taxifolia. Compared with most important commercial trees, the northwestern Douglas fir is remarkably easy to reproduce. It is an abundant cedar, grows very rapidly, and inhabits a region with every climactic advantage. 
in the typical fir districts of oregon and washington deforested land which escapes recurring fire is usually restocked naturally and with astounding rapidity the exception to this rule are where the destruction of seed trees has been wide and absolute where already established competing species are not removed with the original forest and where the surviving fir is too old to seed the two latter conditions are most prevalent near the coast where the wet climate not only tends to protect slashings from fire and thus preserve the undergrowth of shade-bearing species which escapes logging but has also prevented the accidental destruction in the past of the original fir stand by fire in considering these natural results as they bear upon proposed methods we find actual destruction of seed supply the easiest to avoid if the original stand contains suitable seed trees we can protect a sufficient number of them if not or if it is less expensive we can secure seed elsewhere more frequent difficulty will lie in determining whether the reproduction of fir should be the sole effort or whether it should not be sacrificed if necessary in order to utilize an existing start toward a second crop of other species this is of peculiar and early importance for it usually also decides the question of protecting the slashing from fire if the present stand is nearly pure fir or if other species are represented almost wholly by merchantable trees there will be no young growth worth saving a new crop must be started from seed and since fir is the quickest and easiest to grow as well as probably the most valuable it should be given every encouragement slash burning and its exceptions in most cases this requires burning the ground after logging not only to reduce the future fire risk but also to provide a suitable seed bed fir much prefers mineral soil to start in as is easily seen from the far greater frequency of seedlings on road grades than on adjacent undisturbed ground covered with hummus and rotten wood hemlock has no such fastidiousness even preferring rotten wood as a seed bed to protect the slashing from fire therefore both preserves the most unfavorable conditions for fir and subjects it to unnecessary competition by its rival hemlock seedlings already established seeds lying on the ground and surrounding or surviving trees which may scatter more seed are all encouraged to shade and stifle the struggling fir seedlings already handicapped by dislike for their situation on the other hand a large proportion of what we now consider typically fir forest has a vigorous ground cover of hemlock and cedar which may become merchantable many years before an entirely new fir crop can be grown the presumably greater value of the latter may be consumed by the heavier carrying charge before returns are available certainly if the promise of profit from other species and the difficulty of establishing fir both reach the extreme protection of the growth already started is the best forestry if it is practicable moreover there may be considerable young growth of other species under conditions which do not preclude satisfactory additional reseeding by fir when the owner is in position to plan far into the future like the government or state he may seek a temporary compromise although expecting eventually to secure pure fir in such a case it may often be best to utilize a first new crop of hemlock but on harvesting this a few decades hence to burn clean and start the next rotation with fir only conditions vary methods between conditions clearly suggesting one course or another all gradations will present themselves and no written rule can be given for determining the dividing line much depends on future relative values of species upon which the owner will have his own opinion more depends upon the character of existing young growth and consequent adaptability to changing conditions after logging even a very thick stand of young hemlock is unlikely to produce much if the overwood has been very dense for so much of it may be so old and stunted by shade that sudden advent of strong light will result merely in distorted worthless branch growth or in killing it outright occasional vigorous young trees just under present merchantable size are of doubtful value because they are likely to blow down the most promising class of undergrowth found in fir forests of the northwest is where there has been sufficient light to produce a fairly thick stand of young hemlock or cedar from five to fifty feet high if the undergrowth from which any second crop may develop is insufficient to be worth much consideration and reseeding must be depended upon entirely there may still be a question as to species if ample natural supply of fir seed can be expected slash burning is indicated but if not and the owner is not prepared to undertake the expense of artificial seeding while at the same time there is a promising natural hemlock supply burning has no object except the reduction of future fire risk 
it may even retard hemlock reproduction both by destroying part of the seed supply and by encouraging the growth of brakes on the area the question here is really a financial one the cost of planting fir under these conditions may be more than reimbursed by the resultant more valuable and rapid growing crop the owner must do his own conjecturing as to future comparative values of the species so far we have discussed slash burning only in its silvicultural relation finding that it encourages douglas fir reproduction and is consequently advisable in northwestern douglas fir types unless there is an exceptionally promising second growth already started the balance will be further in its favor in doubtful cases because of the protective feature this is discussed more fully in another chapter but it is well to recall here that immunity from recurring fire is the first essential of profitable reforestation to secure second growth by treatment which threatens its destruction later is bad management unless the original saving is ample to cover subsequent greater cost of protection this is seldom the case how to reseed the area dismissing the exceptions noted and returning to our rule that another crop of douglas fir is usually the best secured by following nature cutting practically clean burning the ground and starting a new even aged stand we have still to consider means of getting this stand started we may depend upon natural reseeding from trees preserved for the purpose or from the surrounding forest or we may resort to planting what are the comparative advantages of these two methods and the circumstances governing choice between them hitherto students of the subject have inclined to favor natural reproduction the very general second growth on deforested land where no aid has been given indicates that excellent results will follow slight assistance red fir fruits frequently and profusely and the seeds carry well in the wind burns have been known to restock fully from seed blown from forested hills a mile or more away moreover while planting always involves initial expense sometimes much may be done to ensure natural seeding with little or no actual outlay there is danger however that in many instances this economy will be more apparent than real if it is affected by actually leaving much value in seed trees abroad and in the east there is comparatively little loss in leaving even a fourth or fifth of the original stand to furnish seed the individual trees left may be good cedars although small little capital is tied up in them and they may be utilized later to equal advantage a mature fir forest of the pacific coast may have no small fruiting trees at all and if left such are likely to be knocked down in logging to leave twenty per cent of the large trees standing would sometimes tie up twenty thousand feet to the acre worth forty or fifty dollars age and windfall may cause loss equal to stumpage increase moreover they can never be utilized without the same expense for roads and machinery that is necessary in original logging the second crop will not be allowed to reach a size requiring such equipment in considering possible windfall loss not the normal wind but the possible maximum storm within the entire life of the second crop must be reckoned with it is probably safe to say of a mature pacific coast fir that leaving enough merchantable timber on a cutting area for adequate seeding costs more than to use it and restock restocking can be done for two dollars to ten dollars an acre which would leave a decided margin for profit on the seed trees and if we undertake to reduce this balance by leaving very few seed trees we decrease the certainty of successful reproduction and increase the danger of entire failure through windfall or accidental destruction when we burn the slashing it cannot be denied however that fire after planting would result in complete loss while seed trees might restock the area again and again after such accidents natural reproduction on the other hand natural reproduction does not always require the leaving of merchantable timber on the cutting area frequently there are enough crooked or conky trees to serve the purpose these defects are not directly transmissible through seed to the offspring although conch is infectious and the young crop should be protected by the removal of the diseased parents after it is well started again seeding from adjacent timber can often be relied upon this is a question of economy and logging operations lay of the ground prevailing wind direction fertility of the stand and other local considerations a valley with healthy fir woods on either side is likely to seed up promptly even if a half mile wide so is a flat at the leeward foot of a hill timbered on the summit where the wind strikes a cutting on a ridge is correspondingly unlikely to restock 
theoretically if a tract of timber were large enough it could be opened up by logging operations which instead of proceeding steadily from one edge might skip every other landing or so until the most remote portion was reached after a few years and then work back again cleaning up the neglected portions after they had seeded the first openings the same effect sometimes results from actual accidental practice it is apparent that rules cannot be laid down for general application generally speaking a logger interested in fir reforestation should study his ground to see if naturally or with inexpensive aid the cut over area will not recede from the sides and from the cull trees he will leave uncut if not he may leave a few merchantable seed bearing trees provided the soil is such as to make them deep rooted and wind firm Groups are better than single trees because less likely to be blown down and easier to protect from the slashing fire. More should be left toward the windward edge. But before tying up any considerable sum in merchantable trees, he should consider the cost and safety of supplementing any shortage of natural supply by artificial seeding. Western Hemlock Tsuga heterophylla since hemlock is so frequently associated with douglas fir the principles governing its reproduction and its relative promise as a second crop have necessarily been largely covered in the preceding discussion of fir the following remarks are merely additional we have seen that the perpetuation of hemlock is advisable only where fir reproduction is difficult to obtain or will be at too great a sacrifice of valuable existing hemlock the first of these conditions is confined chiefly to pure hemlock stands and to coast regions where the fir is often too cold to seed well the second may exist on the coast or in certain moist interior regions where there is a heavy hemlock undergrowth in either case natural hemlock reproduction will be counted upon both because it is practically certain to occur and because if it were not certain and artificial aid were necessary we would abandon hemlock entirely and devote our efforts to fir in short discussion of hemlock as a second crop need not include systematic attempts to seed the ground but may be confined to protection of what we have to begin with in a straight hemlock proposition the protection question may differ considerably from that involved by deciding between fir and hemlock in the latter case because of the assistance of fire to fir the growth already on the ground must have considerable value to warrant foregoing the several advantages of slash burning in the former slash burning has no object except to reduce future risk the inference is that a much less promising stock of young growth is worth protecting while this is true there is danger of overestimating its value especially if care is not taken in logging it has been remarked that suppressed misshapen hemlock is not apt to make a healthy growth that windfall is a peril and that if the previous shade has been heavy sudden opening to sunlight may be fatal it should also be remembered that even slightly injured young hemlock is worthless for it is almost certain to be attacked by borers anything which deadens a small portion of the bark like axe blazes fire scorch or scars from strap leads is dangerous hemlock is more liable than fir to general defects like black streak borers fungus disease and mistletoe therefore investment in reforestation needs the maximum safeguard against them in many instances better results may be obtained from a new healthy seedling stand following a purifying fire even at some loss of time than from well started young growth which is unhealthy and likely not only to fail itself but also to infect any seedlings which may come in among it consequently if the slashing is not large and reproduction from the sides may be counted on the above considerations coupled with the reduction of future fire risk may suggest slash burning just as in the case of fir the remarks apply particularly if it is considered necessary to log as clean as possible with a good healthy start toward a new forest however it will usually be best to keep fire out for the material saved will warrant greater expense and protection during the growing period representative tracks both on the coast and in the cascades have been studied which show that with care in lumbering enough good young hemlock too small for logs or skids could be saved after present-day logging of a heavy mixed fir and hemlock stand to produce in fifty years eleven thousand or twelve thousand feet of timber over fourteen inches in diameter this would not be wholly additional to the second crop of seedlings which might be produced if these trees were not preserved for the ground and light they use would be denied to the seedlings but undoubtedly the yield would be greater than could be secured if they were destroyed this means that under similar conditions we may go still further and actually apply the selection system especially if the original stand is nearly pure hemlock
so far we have discussed areas left by present-day logging methods suppose however the owner of a good tract of hemlock having decided that conditions do not warrant trying to get fur is willing to modify his methods for the sake of better hemlock returns at some future cutting he would probably do best to take out only the mature trees leaving everything which is still growing with fair rapidity greater light will stimulate these immensely as well as encourage further seeding of the ground the few merchantable trees he spares together with those now unmerchantable will in perhaps twenty years make another excellent crop by leaving a fairly dense stand he prevents the windfall danger which threatens the survivors of too vigorous cutting and also prevents them from assuming the branchy form of trees which receive too much side light the fire danger is much reduced by resultant shading of the ground and slightly by the lesser cover of debris in short he makes the most economical use of the ground and the capital represented by the trees he spares is well invested to sum up hemlock lends itself to almost every form of management determination as to which is most advisable is governed by its extremely variable manner of occurrence and by the local promise offered by associate species the foregoing discussion can only serve as suggestive when considering given conditions western cedar thuya plicata except for small swamp and river bottom areas where the land is likely to be more valuable for agriculture than for forest culture pure cedar stands are not common therefore it is as a component of mixed stands that cedar is likely to become a problem in conservative management to some extent it presents a peculiar question by being taken out alone for special purposes such as poles and bolts independent of ordinary logging of saw timber western cedar is a typically shade-bearing tree and also endures much ground moisture its occurrence as an understory and in swamps does not indicate that it always requires such conditions however but more often means merely that they protected it from competition or from destruction by fire charred remains of very large fine cedar are often found on comparatively dry slopes where fire has resulted in complete occupation by fir at present cedar's failure to reappear there after removal is probably because its thin bark and shallow roots allowed its destruction by a fire which was survived by some better protected fir seed trees nevertheless cedar must be classified as a moisture loving species and occupies dry soils only in coast or mountain localities where there is a compensating heavy rainfall reproduction and management of western cedar have not been sufficiently studied to warrant very positive conclusions this neglect is probably due to a wide belief that in spite of its present commercial importance its place in the future forest will be small it most commonly occurs with other trees and heavy stands which make the preservation of any young cedar difficult because of the destructiveness of logging being of comparatively slow growth also persistent in retaining branches when grown in the light it is not as promising for artificial reproduction as douglas fir or white pine to let it become old enough for good shingle material will be too expensive to pay for roofing is one of the wood products easiest to substitute for while cedar is adapted for poles posts and other underground use less decay resisting species can be made equally durable by chemical treatment in other words as a second crop it is probably below other species in ease of establishment rapidity and quantity and will not have sufficient peculiar value to compensate for consequent less economical use of the ground there may be exceptions to this rule good young cedar in forests which are to be handled under the selection system should be carefully protected it can always be utilized and may bring revenue before anything else can be cut for the same reason it has been suggested for planting with fir and white pine either simultaneously as a small proportion or later in blank spaces where others fail under such conditions the main stand will not be modified and the cedar will afford a valuable adjunct sitka spruce picea stichinesis although found in the moister mountain regions this exceedingly valuable tree seldom occurs to a commercially important extent except along the coast where it is common on swales and fertile beaches and in river bottoms often forms pure stands of a great density yields of one hundred thousand feet an acre are not unusual and the trees are very large it is also common although of small size in swamps this spruce reproduces readily in openings whether made by fire or cutting unthrifty specimens may be found under shade but considerable light is necessary for successful development even then height growth in youth averages slower than that of fir or hemlock 
the leader shoot is likely to die so that hardly more than twenty five per cent of the young trees establish a regular form of growth before a height of twenty or thirty feet is reached after this stage spruce grows uniformly and rapidly still somewhat slower than fir in height but exceeding it in diameter the branches are slow to die however so that the tree remains bushy for most of its length until it reaches sixty or eighty feet in height and even afterward a dense stand is required to clear it in many pure spruce forests the larger trees have been able to withstand the pruning influences and remain limmy while the smaller ones being pushed in height growth to reach sufficient light for survival have cleared themselves with remarkable rapidity the natural occurrence of sitka spruce except in alaska is probably limited chiefly to situations where it escapes competition in youth at least with the more hardy and rapid growing species it has the greatest advantage over these on river bottoms and flats where there is a dense growth of deciduous brush and where the soil is very wet in spring in considering it as a possible second crop the same competition must be remembered whether seeding is natural or artificial the extent to which it will hold its own with any considerable quantity of other species is doubtful if such are present and the situation is adapted to them any expensive effort to get spruce merely by modifying methods of logging or handling the slash is certainly likely to be disappointing under the conditions mentioned as peculiarly favorable for spruce gradual natural restocking may be expected if some seed supply is preserved but since the growth is rather slow and a thin stand will remain limmy it will pay to hasten returns by supplementary artificial planting some authorities question the financial practicability of this on the ground that since spruce is of slower growth it will pay better to use the ground for fir but the latter is unlikely to be true of bottom land after summing all its advantages the peculiar merits of spruce for certain purposes should be weighed for sufficiently higher stumpage value will compensate for delay in harvesting the crop moreover sitka spruce has not been as thoroughly studied by foresters as the more prominent western trees and while the foregoing notes represent general present opinion further figures on the rate of height growth may be more encouraging there is no doubt that diameter increases rapid from the start most of the disadvantage mentioned also decreased toward the southern limit of the spruce range the growth on the oregon coast being rapid end of section four section five of practical forestry in the pacific northwest by edward tyson allen this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by k hand forestry and the forest part two western yellow pine pinus ponderosa in this species we have the most important western conifer which most often permits the selection system of management with certain exceptions in which the entire stand is mature the object of conservative logging should be to remove trees past the age of rapid growth and foster those that remain for a later cut when compromising the entire stand or at least clearly dominating it with all ages fairly evenly represented successful in reproduction and not so dense as to present mechanical difficulties it is ideally adapted to this form of management the important underlying principle is that since for a period of its life the normal individual tree increases in wood production and then declines it is bad economy to cut it while it is still growing rapidly or to allow it after slowing down to occupy ground which might be used by a tree still in the vigor of production for example if at one hundred years old it contains five hundred board feet it has averaged an addition of five feet a year throughout its life if at 125 years old it contains but 560 feet, the average increment will be but four and one half feet a year. It will not give equal return for the soil, moisture, and light it monopolizes during these 25 years. At the same time, probably there are young trees nearby which hitherto have averaged below the maximum, but if released from its competition, will forge ahead for a period at the end of which they will give a greater annual return than if cut at present. It would be as bad economy to cut these today as to spare the overmature tree. In short, the production of the forest is not only sustained, but actually increased by removing the oldest trees at just the proper time, and is decreased by taking out young trees either not yet at the natural age of greatest mean annual increment or capable of artificial stimulation by thinning. 
by studying the relation of age to production in the particular locality the proportion of different age classes and also finding the approximate average diameter which corresponds to the age at which he desires to cut the professional forester can make a very accurate selection of the trees which can be removed to best advantage at present and also fix the time and yield of the next cutting fortunately however commercial and silvicultural considerations accidentally coincide so nearly under average yellow pine conditions as to make certain rough rules which can be laid down entirely consistent with logging methods now in practice diameter is far from exact indication of age for the location of the forest and the situation of the individual tree especially as it affects the relation between height and diameter growth are potent factors but as a rule merchantability for saw material is not far from maturity in a great majority of cases the approximate minimum diameter for cutting which would be fixed by the forester would be somewhere between sixteen and thirty inches but say it were eighteen inches for example it would not arbitrarily apply throughout the stand most trees with yellow smooth bark and small heavy limbed tops perhaps partially dead are mature regardless of their size if small they have been crowded or stunted and may as well be cut trees with large healthy crowns composed of many comparatively small branches and with rough dark bark showing no flat scaling are sure to be growing rapidly even if quite large they are also less desired by the lumberman who often calls them black pine or black jack so may often be spared without much sacrifice for seed trees or in order to continue their rapid wood production the seed tree problem in such a pine forest and under such a system as has been described is comparatively simple for there are likely to be enough young trees of fruiting age left to fill up the blanks between existing seedlings the density of the latter determines to a large extent the number and location of seed trees necessary but there should always be two to four to the acre even if this requires leaving some that would otherwise be logged under this system recurring cuts may be made at periods of perhaps thirty or forty years taking out each time the trees which have passed the minimum diameter since the last previous cut it is obvious however that if the process is to continue indefinitely protection must be absolute destruction of young growth will stop the rotation at the time the surviving older material is harvested at each cut the brush should be disposed of with this end in view if the stand is very thin it may not add much to the danger of fire and especially if reproduction is difficult and requires shelter may best be left spread on the ground at some distance from remaining trees otherwise and this is the rule it should be piled and usually burned in this process and in logging every effort should be made to protect existing young growth from injury ground fire should be prevented now and always hereafter so far however we have been considering how to make the most of a stand of many ages due to constant reproduction permitted by the light supply in a fairly open forest on the other hand yellow pine sometimes produces a mature stand so heavy that there is little young growth beneath it or even a thin old stand with either little reproduction or an invasion of lodgepole pine such conditions are usually due to fire at some period in the first of these cases usually the dense stand has resulted from a fire which destroyed its predecessor not so completely as to remove the seed supply but sufficiently to afford light for a more uniformly dense crop of seedlings than would occur in the normal forest these have been thinned out as the stand grew old but never to a degree which allowed much reproduction beneath them the natural cycle will be begun again in time for toward the end of the life of this unusually heavy stand seedlings will begin to appear gradually as individual old trees die and admit more and more light the other exceptions described are due to more recent ground fires which have destroyed only the less hardy young growth and perhaps also encouraged the lodgepole which within its range is always quick to take burned ground the same result is almost sure to follow the Indian method of forest protection sometimes advocated, which consists of purposely running ground fires frequently in order to prevent accumulation of sufficient debris to make an accidental fire fatal to timber of commercial size. While such immunity may be secured, and perhaps without sacrifice in stands so heavy as to have no reproduction, or when the latter has already been destroyed, it is obviously at the expense of young growth if any exists the counter-argument that a small proportion escaping will be sufficient for the second crop is fallacious because good timber will not be produced from these scattering seedlings subjected to strong light by later logging other means are necessary if the forest is to be reproduced this brings us to the possible management of yellow pine as an even aged forest
thoughtful foresters are beginning to suspect that while the indian system of fire protection will usually be fatal if ordinary logging practice is followed it may serve as an adjunct to a system which if carefully applied will be better than selection cutting for some of our pine areas this plan is suggested where there is little young growth worth protecting and consists of depending upon seed trees almost entirely for reproduction protecting carefully until the resultant even aged second growth is large enough to stand blight fire and then burning periodically at such a season and with such safeguards as will prevent the fire from being injuriously severe not only are there many existing forests where absence of small trees will permit clean cutting without sacrifice, but the same condition is likely to occur eventually in stands following selective logging if the second cut is long delayed. Although a good representation of all ages under the diameter limit remains, the destiny of this may become too great to allow further reproduction, and in time the dominant trees will shade out all smaller growth. To allow this purposely, choosing heavy cuts at intervals long enough to mature the crop from seed rather than frequent light cuts of a constantly replenishing stand, thus reducing the necessity of fire prevention, is the aim of those who favor clean cutting as the most practicable system. They assume that additional investment in seed trees or planting to ensure prompt starting of a new crop after cutting will be unnecessary or at least offset by the smaller fire charge and greater economy of logging. Theoretically, such practice with a species adapted to the selective method is uneconomical, for the ground is not fully utilized. Accidental open places in the stand are not occupied by young trees which would otherwise fill them. Time is lost by not starting the second crop until after logging, for were there no fire previously there would be considerable seedling growth which, although perhaps dominant because of shade, would begin to amount to something much quicker than that supplied by seed trees afterward nor is the system feasible where there is much fir or other species less fire resisting than pine it is dangerous in practice except where there is very little combustible matter on the ground and fire is generally easy of control and exceedingly dangerous to advocate because it serves as a pretext and example for indiscriminate carelessness with fire under all conditions finally the alleged immunity of pine from injury by ground fires is exaggerated as a matter of fact while the whole stand is seldom perceptibly hurt the immediate or gradual death of a good tree here and there thins the stand very considerably in a few years and it is such a thinning process in the past which makes many pine tracks bear but five thousand feet to the acre where otherwise they would yield two or three times as much scorching also retards the growth of trees not actually injured otherwise the technical objections given above may seem sometimes to be offset by practical advantages and the system is likely to receive expert approval for certain conditions provided it is not used as a cloak without taking sincere steps to replace the destroyed second growth by adequate seed trees or artificial seeding the latter danger may easily warrant public alarm manifested by restrictive laws universal ground burning of green timber will distinctly reduce the prospect of unassisted natural reforestation on the great area of potential timber land in which as a resource regardless of ownership the public is vitally interested under present conditions at least a large proportion of this is likely to be logged without any view to a future crop it is questionable whether any state should or will legally approve ground burning except under stipulation of proper management thereafter unfortunately it is necessary in concluding this discussion of yellow pine to admit that while an attempt has been made to outline the methods which will ensure a second crop the promise of satisfactory financial return is more doubtful than that offered by some other species compared with the typical coast trees such as douglas fir spruce and hemlock the growth is slow and the yield is small the chief circumstances in its favor are low land values, lesser fire risk, cheapness and certainty of reproduction, and excellent market prospects. Less investment compensates somewhat for longer rotation and smaller yield. Low taxation, however, is an absolute essential. Western White Pine P. Monlicola Although as a distinct forest type this valuable tree is limited chiefly to Idaho, it occurs occasionally in mixture or small tracts over a wide range, and no reason appears why its commercial importance should not be extended by planting on cut-over lands. Its high value, rapid growth, and heavy yield make it a particularly promising species for growing under forestry principles. Its chief requirements for success are fairly good moist land, access by the seed to mineral soil, and ample light for the young seedlings except that it is more fastidious as to soil white pine usually demands about the same treatment as that prescribed for douglas fir including clean cutting 
slash burning and establishing a new even aged stand by seed trees or artificial restocking under favorable conditions the stand is nearly even aged with little undergrowth except of undesirable species what small pine may exist is seldom thrifty enough to be worth saving so the best thing is to clean off the ground for the double purpose of removing weed trees and favoring valuable reproduction like that of fir the natural rotation of white pine forests seems to have been accomplished often by the aid of fire and where not given this aid it suffers from lack of suitable seed bed and from the competition of other species already established individual seed trees left in logging are not successful because of shallow root system and almost certain windfall replacement must be by seeding or planting or by leaving small tracts of pine surrounded by cleared fired lines to protect them when the slashing is burned the size and distance apart of these must be determined by their situation and exposure to wind concerning both the danger of windfall and the carrying of seed especially in younger growths the quantity of merchantable material tied up in this way is not so great as is sometimes necessary in the case of red fir where single seed trees may contain several thousand board feet on the other hand stumpage value may be high for this reason artificial replacement may often be more profitable especially where there is reasonable safety against recurring fire a thing to be borne in mind is that white pine seems to reach a healthier and better development when mixed with a small proportion of other species such as cedar tamarack spruce lodgepole pine and douglas fir so there is no object in trying to produce an absolutely pure stand some authorities think that sixty per cent of pine with the rest helping to prune it is an ideal mixture lodgepole pine p mariana present interest in private reproduction of this species hardly warrants treating it at length in this publication although unquestionably it will eventually occupy a higher place in the market than at present and its readiness to seize burned land in many regions will make it a factor whether desired or not where yellow pine will grow the problem is most likely to be to discourage lodgepole competition in strictly lodgepole territory however it may be the only promise of a new forest generally speaking an even aged growth should be induced by clean cutting if the entire crop can be utilized slash burning in such cases is desirable the chief difficulty is in providing seed supply for either individual seed trees or small groups are almost certain to be blown down experiments so far indicate that heavy strips must be spared chosen to afford the least present loss and safeguarded by fire lines in some lodgepole stands especially where only certain sizes are marketable the cutting practically amounts to thinning here obviously the effort should be to prevent over thinning and to remove debris with the least damage to the remaining stand piling and burning is essential sugar pine p lambertiana this extremely valuable pine commercially limited to the oregon and california mountains is fastidious in its choice of conditions not a frequent or prolific seed bearer it still insists on a moist loose seed bed and prefers the natural forest floor to burned over land it cannot stand drought when young and except on cool northern slopes seedlings may be killed or stunted by exposure to full sunlight on the contrary it demands more and more light as it grows older and will be suppressed or killed if unable to secure it under natural conditions it perpetuates itself best by filling open places in the forest for the above reasons sugar pine is naturally a component of mixed forests and it is doubtful whether it will be successfully grown as a pure stand unfortunately also logging methods which are both the simplest and most favorable to the reproduction of its associates may be discouraging to sugar pine reproduction nevertheless its value warrants strong efforts to favor it and is an argument where considerable young sugar pine exists against either clean cutting or the use of fire the forest service for which authority much of the above discussion of this species was taken offers the following general outline for management in california since the forests in which sugar and yellow pine occur vary greatly in composition the method of treatment must also vary for this the forest types are already distinguished may form a basis on the lower portion of the sugar pine yellow pine type where sugar pine forms but a small proportion of the stand only the yellow pine should be considered for the future forest all merchantable sugar pine may therefore be removed it will be necessary to leave only a few seed trees of yellow pine to restock the ground although usually it will be a wiser policy to leave a fair stand since this can be removed as a second cutting when reproduction is established this procedure would also hold for areas on which yellow pine occurs in nearly pure stands 
In these localities, dense stands of second-growth yellow pine occur. It will often be profitable, where there is a market at hand, to thin these stands when they are about 30 years old, removing the suppressed trees for mine props. Trees 6, 8, and 10 inches and up are used for this purpose and sell for from 5 to 6 cents a running foot. On the upper portion of the sugar pine yellow pine type, where both species have about an equal representation in the stand, seed trees of each should be left, wherever practicable, in the proportion of two sugar pines to one yellow pine. In the fir belt, where sugar pine and fir are the principal species, the fir should be clean cut whenever possible and sugar pine should be relied upon for the future forest. On all lands, the Douglas spruce, white fir, and incense cedar should be cut whenever possible, and shoots, skidways, and bridges should be constructed from the two last-named species. The following instructions are issued for marking timber on national forest sales in the sugar pine yellow pine type. Owing to the large size of the trees, marking in this type of forest should be done with special care, since a slight mistake involves a comparatively large amount of timber. On nearly all of the lands included in this type, the ground is now but partly and insufficiently stocked with young timber. The areas of forest are constantly becoming more accessible to markets, and there is every indication of a strong future demand at greatly increased prices. On nearly every tract, a second cut can be made within 30 years. All marking under present sales should be done strictly with reference to two points. 1. Stocking the cut over land as fully as possible with sugar and yellow pine. 2. Securing a second cut within 30 years. All cutting should be done under the selection system, which requires a careful choice of the individual trees to be removed. Fixed diameter limits and the leaving of any specified number of seed trees per acre can be very largely disregarded. The condition of every sugar and yellow pine on the sale area should be studied closely to determine whether that tree will be merchantable 30 years hence, by which time a second cut is probable. As a rule, the trees which will remain merchantable for another 30 years should be left. Suppressed and crowded trees which cannot develop should be removed. Under this system of marking, ordinarily about one half of the present stand of merchantable pine would be left uncut. Will it pay? On areas where practically all of the pine is overmatured and would be cut under the rule given above, a sufficient stand must be left to reseed thoroughly the cut over land. This requires not less than four full seed-bearing trees at least 25 inches in diameter per acre. The strongest and thriftiest trees available should be selected for this purpose, but not less than the number specified must be left even if every tree will be a total loss before a second cut is possible. Extensive areas of pine timber which are not yet fully mature should be excluded from the sale. On patches or small areas of immature pine, which it is not practicable to exclude from the sale, cutting should be very light, limited to one-third or less of the largest trees, or omitted altogether. No attempt to discriminate sharply between sugar and yellow pine should be made, as both trees are almost equally desirable. Where a choice is necessary, sugar pine should be favored on moist situations, as in canyons, moist pockets or benches, and on northerly exposures. Yellow pine should be favored on dry situations, including exposed ridges and southern exposures. Fir and incense cedar should be marked as a rule, too low as a diameter as these trees are merchantable in order to reduce the proportion of these species in coming reproduction. It is essential, however, that no large openings be made in the present stand, since the exposed ground is in danger of reverting to chaparral, or of becoming so dry from evaporation that no reproduction will follow cutting. Where the stand of pine is insufficient to reseed thoroughly and protect the cutover area, enough sound, thrifty fir and cedar should be left to form a fairly even cover with openings less than a quarter of an acre in size. The undercurrent of all opinion upon sugar pine up to date is that reproduction will not be very successful unless enough growth to shelter the seedlings remains after logging. Where the fire risk permits, the same end may be furthered by leaving the tops scattered on the ground. Little experimenting has been done in planting sugar pine, but there are many indications that except where conditions strongly favor natural reproduction, it will be resorted to eventually if any particular attempt is made to get this species. Leaving large seed trees is not only expensive, but rather uncertain, because heavy seed years are several years apart and squirrels consume a large portion of an ordinary crop. Transplants which have received nursery shelter until past the greatest danger of drying out should prove most successful on heavily cut south slopes. Redwood, Sequoia, Sempervirens 
although probably the most rapidly growing of all american commercial trees and also of high market standing redwood has been little studied by foresters the layman is still more confused by its many peculiarities growing to a size of twenty feet in diameter and three hundred fifty feet high reaching an age of well over one thousand years and seldom reproducing by means of seed it is not surprising that it was long regarded as ill adapted to second crop management although observing that suckers sprout from the stumps with great rapidity the lumbermen generally regarded these mushroom growths as abnormal and temporary and believed as virgin timber to be the finely vanishing remnant of a prehistoric species unsuited to present-day conditions it was next discovered that the sucking habit is no new one indeed that the majority of the present stand however old began as sprouts from roots or stumps of its predecessors this is evident from the circular arrangement of several trees around the spot where their parent stood these old sprouts were of very slow growth for they were shaded by a forest of extreme density as seedlings they could have neither germinated nor grown but as suckers they were kept alive by the parent until light supply became available through their increasing height or through thinning of the forest under such conditions centuries were required to produce large trees the owner of today, by cutting down the old stand gives the suckers conditions hitherto unknown to the redwood the vigor and susceptibility to the aid of light which originally was necessary in the sprout growth to perpetuate the species at all now respond to entire freedom and light in an astonishing manner even after severe slashing fires char the stumps the latter throw out clusters of sprouts which grow several feet a year logging works thirty or forty years old have come up to trees nearly one hundred feet high Naturally, such timber has a heavy percentage of sap wood and is soft and brittle, but it is already suitable for pilling, box lumber, and like purposes, and improves constantly. Since reproduction by seed does not enter into the problem, financial possibilities depend almost wholly on the nature of the original stand. There are many types of redwood forest, pure and mixed, flat and slope. If the old trees are few to the acre, the sprout clusters will be so far apart that excess of side light will produce clumps of swell-budded, short limmy trees of little use for lumber. That is, unless there is also a seedling growth of fir or other species to fill the blanks and bring up the density. Where such a nurse growth is to be counted on, or where the redwood trees are small and close together, ideal conditions for a certain rapid and well-formed second crop exist. The thinner the original redwood stand, the greater the effort necessary at the time of logging to obtain the required density. The leaving of seed trees of other species, with as many as possible small trees of both redwood and other species, and the maximum protection of all from fire, should then be the means employed. On some tracts, the proportion of redwood will not warrant this effort. On some, it is not even required the question of whether it pays to hold redwood land is therefore almost wholly local but when conditions are favorable it can be answered affirmatively because of the extremely rapid growth with less doubt than of almost any other species there is some tendency to overproduction of sprouts by redwood stumps removal of the excess with an axe saving those closest to the ground and not over thinning to the extent of reducing the density conducive to height growth and shedding of low branches improves the chances of those remaining End of section 5.